a very good morning to all the viewers of sikot india and the sikot india scholar program on behalf of the organizing committee and the executive committee of sikot india i wish you all a very happy new year and welcome you all to a new academic year with new webinars in the sikot india scholar program today the faculty whom we have with us is dr aditya daftari he is a renowned musculoskeletal radiologist practicing in the city of mumbai he is a consultant radiologist and director at innovision imaging he is also a radiologist at the famous sportsmed clinic and he is a world renowned authority on musculoskeletal radiology he is going to be telling us about ultrasound guided injections in orthopedics a primer may i now welcome dr aditya daftari and request him to kindly make his presentation welcome aditya thank you thanks for for the kind words i am not world renowned at anything but um, i will at least try and enlighten you on the issue that i have worked with for a while so the topic of today's um, talk is ultrasound guided injections in orthopedics a primer um, and what we are going to talk about is a few different things so the overview of the talk is um, that ultrasound will allow us for direct dynamic visualization of various structures in the body uh, especially superficial musculoskeletal tissues the direct dynamic visualization allows for real time image guided intervention and it's shown time and time again that image guided interventions are more accurate less painful and far more effective so this is an article that believe it or not an orthopedic surgeon sent me to try and convince orthopedic surgeons to use ultrasound guided injections um and uh, it's one that's been really useful for us so we all know that everybody's done hundreds of injections before ultrasound machines they all had excellent outcomes because used 20 ml of local anesthesia and you know so everything was good um the second part of this states that many clinical cadaveric and radiological studies have shown that ultrasound guided injections are more accurate than palpation guided or blind injection in various joints and soft tissue structures even joints such as the knee where we are all sure that we got it and then once a team work of musculoskeletal radiologists sports surgeon is established it can be done in a quick and reproducible and simple manner this is something i want to spend a minute to harp on about which is that i know everybody wants to do these procedures themselves i think what you will see over time is that one is um, it involves a significant amount of objectivity in identifying structures there is a significant learning curve and i think building a good radiologic partner when you're doing this is the amount you're developing a good and successful practice so the overview of our talk will be we'll talk about practice building some injections and injectables pre procedural planning procedures and procedural tips and post procedure management i'll refer you to an article that i wrote with a colleague of mine dr alpana karnik which we published in the indian journal of radiology in 2015 um it's freely available and downloadable online so please feel free to go to it and look at it it gives you some idea in regards to musculoskeletal interventions okay so in order for injections to work i think the most important thing for us to remember is there should be an appropriate diagnosis there should be a good clinical suspicion there should be an appropriate intervention that means we should have the appropriate thing that we inject into the appropriate location it should be a well directed injection the injection should be exactly where you want it to be and typically this should be followed by appropriate rehab and physiotherapy so in order to get a good diagnosis we should have a good clinician with a high clinical suspicion for abnormality and this is what i aim to work with and this is why i look at my orthopedic colleagues and that's why i actually don't go injecting people because they come to me i would usually work in coordination with an orthopedic person correlative imaging is important i mean sometimes we see something on ultrasound and it's not what it seems so it's important to look at the x-rays and the mris before you make a call on what the diagnosis is uh, is and then i think ultimately the clinical examination is also important sometimes we see findings on mris x-rays and ultrasounds but that's not really what the patient's symptoms are and we have to treat something else altogether okay to start with we will talk about the injections and injectables i think most of the work that i do in my pain management spectrum is going to be centered around using the um in the needles in the range of 25 to 22 gauge sometimes i'll go down to an 18 gauge and normally i will 
pretty much access most of the stuff I need to access barring something like deeper, like the hip joint with a one and a half inch needle. So one of the things about ultrasound and ultrasound procedures is you can apply pressure and so a shorter needle can make a longer distance. Um, so that's sort of one of the other things to do. The other things to be important uh, aware about is all the kinds of local anesthetics that are available in the market, long or short acting, motor or sensory, and then finally whether they are also containing um, methylparaben, which is a neurotoxic agent when you're doing perineural injections. Um, the other things we want to know is we want to know about things like uh, the different steroids available in the market, barring kenocort, there's also orocort, which is not, which is preservative free, um, and a bunch of other agents that we can use. PRP is obviously something that has uh, value in various situations, so make sure you're aware of which are the different kinds of PRP that are available and which ones you're going to use. And last but not least, we talk about uh, visco supplementation, uh, which is something that we can use for intra-articular injections. I won't spend too much time on sclerosins and the other agents that we can use in some other situations. In terms of pre-procedure planning, the things that I tell most people to do is first is to confirm the indication, so have a good idea of what you're injecting and why. I do spend a fair amount of time, in fact, I probably spend more time on my procedure explaining what the procedure is and getting informed consent for the procedure. I think patients sometimes think that the injection is a panacea, whereas it's actually just the beginning of, um, of what is to follow. Um, I discuss complications very openly with patients, things that are very low likelihood. I talk about the post-injection flare very often. I do mention infection and bleed, in, uh, you know, uh, infection and bleeding. I think these are important things for patients to know. I also talk to them about post-injection pain and I reassure them, of, I, I sort of remind them about this before as well as after the procedure. Um, once you have a clear understanding with the patient of what you want to do, I do a pre-injection site and trajectory planning, and then I maintain sterility. So um, just sort of one of the things in terms of pre-procedure planning, I do a pre-procedure uh, timeout. I make sure that I'm injecting the patient on the correct side um, and in the correct location. So I normally point and poke and ask where exactly the symptoms are. At the time that you're going to do an injection, you know the structure you're going to inject, you put the transducer over it, you identify the target, and the first thing I do is even actually mark a point on the skin as to where I'm going to put my transducer and where my needle entry site will be. I do take time to plan my movements in the room and on the patient. Um, and I also make time to indicate to my assistant where I want them to stand, what I want them to do, and I tell the patient what I'm going to do. Um, this is something that's kind of important because um, a lot of these injections have um, sometimes variable outcomes. And I think gaining patient confidence is very important when we do these procedures. So I always sort of try and do things where, that are well planned because if the patient feels you're stumbling and stuttering around the room, they're fully wide awake, they're very nervous and tense. It's important to show that you're confident and that they know what you're doing because then they're far more confident about what's going to happen and they comply better with what's happening. I check and draw my injectables, obviously maintain sterility. And then when you're proceeding, proceed very confidently. But obviously, I don't need to tell orthopedic surgeons how to do that. Um, so when we are doing an ultrasound-guided injection, the key things are the rules of engagement, which means to identify the target accurately. So on ultrasound, you should be able to identify the structure, know the ultrasound anatomy, its normal and abnormal appearances. Identify the most appropriate trajectory. And in order to do this, what we need to do is be able to identify any important structures that are in between, um, neurovascular especially, and, and bony structures that could get in the way of our needle. And then we should have a decent understanding of needle dynamics, and I'll get into that in a moment. So this is sort of a series of videos that I've created that will show you the effects of needle and transducer position. So as you change the position of a needle, um, so you can see in this video, I'm tilting the needle up and down. So as you change the position of this needle, craniopathically, mediolaterally, it will tend to flip in and out in different ways from the ultrasound transducer, and therefore we will see the needle differently. So for example, here I'm tilting the needle, and if you look at the needle on the right screen here with the video, what you will see is that the needle as it tips down and up, you will see it to different degrees. And basically when the needle is parallel to the transducer, that is when you see it the most clearly. When it is oblique to the transducer, it becomes less well seen. 
The second thing that we talk about is the effect of the transducer. So when you have a needle in place and you have a transducer overlying it, slight changes in transducer position can make a very significant difference in your visualization of the needle. So the first movement that I will talk about is sliding. And then for that, I'm gonna show you is basically the transducer moves straight in the horizontal plane. And you can see this, it's moving very straight in the horizontal plane across the needle. And as you move this transducer across the needle in the horizontal plane, what you will find is that the needle will uh, sort of, as you can see in this image, go in and out of the plane of the ultrasound transducer. And therefore you may or may not see the needle or you'll see it to different degrees depending on where you are in relation to the needle. The second effect is the twisting effect, which means that if you hold the transducer a little bit oblique to the trajectory of the needle, like this with the twisting effect, um, you may see the needle differently or you won't, you will see part of the needle, but not the tip. And therefore you may not be at exactly the point you want to be. So for example, here you can see with this twisting movement um, here, because the twist is centered at the middle of the needle, but with the twist, you can see how the middle of the needle goes in and out of the field of view and the distal tip is seen. You could imagine if this movement was at the distal tip of the needle, you may or may not see the distal tip of the needle, right? and therefore you may not identify the target correctly. The third movement is, that's important is the yawing movement. In this case, the transducer is the same position, but essentially what happens is that we twist the ultrasound beam one way or the other. And this, if you will, is almost like the same as if you were to look at um, um, the surface of a, you know, from, from different angles, and therefore you would see the needle very differently as you yawed across the needle. Um, and so here you can see with this yawing movement, essentially what's happening is your trans your needle over here will be seen better and less well as you yaw from one side to the other. So once you have a clear idea of these things, I think the first things to do are that I personally do when I do a procedure is I spend a minute to connect with the patient. I'll tell them something polite. I'll say, why are you here? How are you doing? What do you do? And I always joke with everybody that one of the reasons I ask them what do you do is because then you can figure out how much you want to build them, but that's just a joke. Um, I do take time to explain in detail the procedure. I find this um, makes patients very confident about what you're doing, very comfortable with what you're doing, and I think that's very important. I mark the skin site, I plan my trajectory, I keep the injectables and everything I might possibly need ready before doing the procedure. I do take some, ta um, some time to make sure that I'm not drawing things in front of the patient. So I try not to wave needles around in front of the patient's face. I find it makes them very uncomfortable. So I will normally fill everything with my back to the patient and, um, and then the needles and everything else in front of me so that they're not watching me draw the fluid, which makes them less tense. Um, when you're starting out doing these procedures, I do encourage people to give a fair amount of local anesthesia or to give that local anesthesia just so you can play around more and the patient doesn't twitch around much. As I mentioned earlier, I use a 25 to 22 gauge needle. The one and a half inch needle is usually good. Sometimes you may need a spinal needle. Um, the injectables we use typically are steroids and local anesthetic. And then once you have things planned properly, you can proceed quite quickly and seamlessly and procedures get over very fast and patients usually say, oh, done. I didn't even realize that. So that's really nice. Um, Another thing I spend a lot of time is on expectation management. Patients think an injection is going to be a cure-all and they're going to be 100% okay. I tell them that there will be various degrees of responses um, that you know you may get 100% better, you may get 80% better, you may get 60% better. So they sort of don't expect this to be the cure-all. And I tell them that the physiotherapy or the other modality is going to be equally important, that this is one part of a two-part process and I find that sort of helps them very significantly in complying with further recovery. Uh, one thing just for you to remember whenever you're doing an ultrasound guide procedure, when you're searching for the needle, hold either the needle steady or the transducer steady. And uh, if I were to sort of put this into you in a surgical perspective, if you're trying to find something on the, um, in a patient, um, you know, you usually open up a field of view and then you move your head back and forth. Um, if you're just sort of moving around the field of view and moving your head and head back and forth simultaneously, it becomes very hard to find something. Okay. So now that you guys have some sense of what an ultrasound guided injection involves, what are some basic changes in trajectory, what I do is show you some of the common and then some of the more challenging and uncommon injections that we do 
um, with ultrasound guided injections. So the first thing that we'll talk about is the shoulder, then we'll move to the elbow and the foot and ankle and other areas as well. So ultrasound guided procedures in the shoulder, the most common things we do are obviously subacromial bursal injections, bicep tendon sheath injections, glenohumeral joints and the AC joint. Then other things we also work on are paralabral cyst, calcific tendinosis and the scapulothoracic bursa. And the common injectable we would use are steroids, local anesthetic, a combination of both or in calcific tendinosis cases, we would consider using um, normal saline to barbitage and aspirate to calcium. So the subacromial bursal injection is a pretty standard injection that everybody does. They've clearly shown that there is statistical improvement in pain and um, uh, symptoms uh, with ultrasound guided injections. Um, and uh, so it's kind of important to do. In order to do an ultrasound guided subacromial bursal injection, I normally do these with patients supine. I like doing most of my pro um, procedures with patients on a bed just because then I don't have to worry about vasovagals and all other problems. It's also comfortable. They don't have places to jump around and it makes things easier. Um, so for the subacromial bursa, you basically place the transducer over the lateral aspect of the shoulder. Um, and uh, what you can see here is as we put this over the lateral aspect of the shoulder, you, this is how your needle would come in. And then here's a video demonstrating how, um, I'm going to play this video again, just so you get a sense of where it's at. So you can see how um, as we do this procedure, you can see the needle um, right here. You'll see the needle being indented through the skin coming in. You can see it's right at the bursa. I can flick up the bursa and as I inject into the bursa, you can see the bursa distend really nicely. And this is a pretty classic subacromial bursal injection. You can see how easy and quick it is. And the patients are actually very comfortable when you do this procedure. And there's no doubt about being in the bursa. The second injection is the biceps tendon sheath injection. And there's plenty of studies that show that ultrasound guided injections are far better than blind injections. Um, and this is a surgical study here that shows an ultrasound guided injection was in the right spot in more than 90% of the cases, whereas blind injections have a really, really crappy um, appropriate uh, location of injection uh, history. Um, it's usually with anterior shoulder pain and sometimes for patients with adhesive capsulitis. Some things to remember about the biceps tendon is that uh, as you rotate the patient medial, uh, you know, supinate and pronate the shoulder, you can see that there is a change in the biceps tendon. This is the biceps tendon here in the bicepital groove, and you can see it sort of moving back and forth. This is the subscapularis tendon that is more laterally. One of the important things that you see with, uh, with this is a concept of anisotropy. So if your transducer is angulated a little bit and not perfectly perpendicular to the tendon, the biceps tendon sheath can look like it's just a small little hole or a little fluid collection. Um, and if you just change the angle, you can see the tendon really nicely. Um, you also notice that there's a vessel along the lateral margin of the biceps tendon sheath and we try not to inject that vessel. Um, when we want to inject the biceps tendon sheath, you keep the transducer transversely oriented along the bicepital groove at its upper end. Um, we will then bring, uh, see the biceps tendon within its sheath like this, and then we'll bring a needle in laterally into the biceps tendon sheath and inject the biceps tendon sheath. The third injection is the glenohumeral joint, and I know everybody says that they all have the glenohumeral joint, but there's very clear data that even in expert hands, um, the ultrasound guided injection is far better than a blind injection. So I think we should stop messing around with doing these uh, blindly and we should be doing all of these by ultrasound guidance. In order to do an ultrasound guided injection um, in the glenohumeral joint, I normally have the patient on the side, painful side up. I use a posterior approach. So there's a transverse image that you get here. This is the humeral head, this is the labrum, this is the glenoid. And uh, what we sort of do is try and bring the trans so kind of the needle in kind of vertically. And what you'll notice in this, because the needle is far more vertical to the transducer, you actually will not see the needle as clearly as you did in that subacromial bursal injection. So here you can see the needle is just at this point. This is where the needle is and it's going up here, but you don't see it quite as nicely. Nevertheless, you're very clear that it's within the joint. And as you inject, you can actually see the joint distend so it's a very classic, excellent way to do a glenohumeral joint injection with great accuracy. Um, the third injection that is again done very commonly is the acromioclavicular joint. And even in this, they've shown by far and away that blind injections are really not doing very well. 
and we should be doing even these injections, which we think are superficial structures um, by ultrasound guidance. So one thing that I've suggested to many orthopedic surgeons is obviously it's very convenient to do the injections blindly in your office. And I say, you know, you should go ahead and do it. But if there isn't a good response, then definitely consider an ultrasound guided injection and send it to somebody who does an ultrasound guided injection for you to take care of it. And I find over time, you'll find that that's really, really helpful for patients and your practice as well. Um, ultrasound guided injections, here you can see the acromioclavicular joint transversely really nicely. You can come into the joint very clearly. One thing when you're doing these injections to be really careful about is the capsule can be quite thick. Sometimes when you're injecting, you're injecting to the capsule and it feels very, very tight. Um, so you need to make sure that you're into the joint properly. Another common indication that we'd use for shoulder injections is injections for calcific tendinosis. Here is a case of a patient with supraspinatus calcific tendinosis. We've shown excellent results with these time and time again. Um, and here is an example of somebody. What you try to do in these cases is you try and identify the calcification really nicely on ultrasound. You find the plane in which the calcification is seen at its best. You give plenty of local anesthesia into, this, into the subacromial bursa because these are very, very painful. Um, you wait for the local anesthetic to act because they can be really painful. And then normally what I do is I tell the patient that um, I will get a needle into or close to the calcification and based on how they're doing, we'll decide how to proceed. The other way to do it, obviously, is you just get them a bit of sedation with anesthesia, which makes the procedure much, much easier. But I think this way avoids taking them to the operating theater. And for the most part, patients do um, manage this procedure quite well. In these videos, what you can see here is a needle to the calcification. Here we pulse the calcification with normal saline so that the sodium chloride mixes with the calcium hydroxyapatite to form soluble sodium hydroxyapatite and calcium chloride, and it dissolves it. And here on this video, what you can see is you can see the calcium actually dissipating in the bursa. Otherwise, you see some of the calcium coming back into the syringe itself, and you can see the calcium within the syringe and aspirate it. Sometimes you have hard calcifications, which usually cause more mechanical symptoms than the acute calcific tendonitis symptoms. And in these cases, the subacromial injection is usually more than adequate to handle these. Um, Paralabral cysts are another interesting area. If you have a patient with a large paralabral cyst but does not want to undergo surgery, then um, you know obviously these cysts can go into the spinal glenoid notch as well as into the suprascapular notch and cause denervation changes in the supra and infraspinatus. Um, you can see cysts really nicely on MRI. We can identify them well on ultrasound. We can get a needle into these cysts fenestrate them repeatedly. They often have thick material. So use a larger bore needle, try and aspirate tissue from them, and then fenestrate them repeatedly all the way out to the wall and collapse them. And here you can see with my repeated fenestrate now that cyst is actually collapsing now. Here it's collapsed kind of completely. Let's go into this, we'd inject some steroid and local anesthetic and move on. Um, tennis elbow is another common indication for which we do this. This is a patient where you can see there's a heterogeneous appearance of the common extensor origin. So this would be a longitudinal image with the transducer like this in the coronal plane along the uh, capitellum and radial head. You can see here the heterogeneous tissue within the common extensor origin. This is the normal tendon. And the things that we've done for this is we can inject into this along the surface of the tendon. Uh, for some patients who have pain, they typically have pain sort of almost at the epicondylar attachment. We also can get into the tendon itself, fenestrate it repeatedly and inject ERP into the tendon itself. Um, and the third thing we can do is, uh, actually I learned this from an orthopedic surgeon when we were talking with Anand Joshi. We were talking about a surgeon, Buddy Savoy, who used to do these um, blind sort of releases for tennis elbow where he would just go in with a scalpel and scrape off the tendon. Um, and what we do it more scientifically. So here we had a case, a, a group of patients in whom we actually found the common extensor origin. And then we went under ultrasound guidance with an 11 number blade and released selectively the common extensor origin or the ECRB. Um, and this is a follow-up scan showing the post-release image of the ECRB. So these are some other things that we can do with almost minimally invasive ultrasound guided surgery. Um, we've done PRP injections and we've shown that uh, We've had pretty good results with PRP, but I think these are still an area that different surgeons and different uh, practicing physicians have different uh, opinions on we use it or not. 
he was an example of somebody with calcific tendonitis along the, in the elbow. Um, and this is something again that we broke up under our guidance. You can see the needle very clearly within the calcification and us pulsating and breaking up that calcification. And then here's the post-procedure radiograph that shows that the calcification is completely gone. Um, we do obviously common flexor and extensor injections along the peritendinous region. So here's the needle right along the superficial surface of the common extensor origin. And then here's another one with the needle right along the superficial aspect of the common flexor origin um, in patients with elbow pain. The radio capitellar joint, um, oftentimes we do it with the, um, with the tennis elbow injection to inject along the deep aspect of the common extensor origin. And here you can see the needle very clearly within the radio capitellar joint uh, between the capitalum here and the radial head here. Uh, we can use a single track to do that. Uh, so we can actually, what happens most of the time is we enter from here, we'll put the needle over the surface of the tendon, and then we'll just redirect it into the uh, joint. So we actually have only one needle entry point and we can inject into both sides through one point. Um, bicepital radial bursal injections we can do by placing the transducer over the dorsal aspect of the distal arm, of, of the proximal arm, and you can get into the space between the radius and ulna and inject along the um, bicepital radial bursa, as you can see over here. Here's the needle, here's the biceps, so you can see us coming in, um, and you'll see the injection in a second with the uh, inject gate flowing along the biceps here. There you go. Olecranon fossa synovitis is also an easy place to access. We can do this longitudinally, come through the triceps and inject there, or come mediolaterally and get into the olecranon. We've done perineural injections also. The nerves are easily seen, um, and we can inject along the perineural sheath. So for example, here's the elbow, and here's actually the spot of nerve, which is the posterior interosseous nerve. And uh, what we can do here is, you, here you can see the nerve. Um, here you can see the vessel. Um, and then here you can see us with a needle that is right near the nerve. So here's the nerve, here's the vessel, and here's the needle sitting right over the surface of the nerve. So you can be very, very accurate and very sure that you're injecting the right spot. And for these injections, obviously, we'd use preservative free local anesthesia, and normally we'd end up using a water-soluble steroid like Betnisol. Here's an injection along the ulnar nerve for somebody who had ulnar nerve-related symptoms. Um, so you've got to be careful with that. Um, here you can see right near the nerve, the needle coming here and now right here. Here's a patient with distal wrist pain who had distal intersection syndrome. And what you can see here on this MRI image as we scroll through it is right at the crossing of the third and second dorsal in, um, uh, extensor tendons. That's where you see that intersection syndrome. And here's fluid. Here on the um, ultrasound, you can see the tracking of the um, of the extensor digitorum, uh, extensor pollicis longus tendon over the second dorsal extensor compartment, which is the location of the patient's pain. So you can see that going in over there again. And we can come very specifically with a needle right over the extensor pollicis longus tendon, inject that, um, and you can uh, be injecting really nicely over there. Notice here that I have taken the transverse approach, the approach that gives me a better look at this tendon and that my needle is within the tendon sheath as opposed to the longitudinal approach in a tendon that's following a very oblique course where it may be harder for me to confirm that my needle is within the tendon sheath. The, the feet is the joy of the musculoskeletal ultrasonologist. So um, we've injected into almost anything you can possibly inject into the feet. Um, so here's a patient who's a cricketer, who's had a tibiotalar joint pain. There's some cartilage where posteriorly and some bone marrow edema. What we did for this patient was we put the transducer longitudinally over this area like this. You can get a needle in from just below that into the um, tibiotalar joint. So here's the tibia, here's the talus, here's the articular cartilage of the talus, here's the needle entering the tibiotalar joint. And we actually did some visco supplementation into this patient. And here you can see really nicely the tibiotalar joint filling up with the fluid that has been injected. We can do subtalar joint injections. So you can come in both medially as well as lactic. You need to, you can see the structures really nicely, the margins of the bone, and you can make sure you're in there um, and inject that. Here's a patient who uh, we injected into the uh, subtalar joint. You can see some of the fluid coming into the, into the out pouching of fluid and most of it going inside the joint here. Um, 
Another thing that's interesting about doing ultrasound guided injections is that uh, there are osteoarthritic small joints that have osteophytes. And when you do radiographic injections, because most of the time you follow the bullseye technique, the osteophytes get in the way. The nice thing about ultrasound is you can see like this cuboid osteophyte over here, and we can actually direct the needle so that it is, um, it is sort of deep to the osteophyte. So it doesn't actually go into the osteophyte, it goes deep to the osteophyte and you can be inside the joint and the osteophyte stops being so much of a problem for us. Here's a patient who was a marathon runner with posterior tibial tendinosis. The first thing that ultrasound lets us do is assess the quality of the tendon. We make sure that the tendon is not a small thready tendon, it's just properly tendinotic. Um, and this is what we, because the tendon was not thready and completely frayed and torn, we got a needle into the tendon. We pulsed it a few times, put a little PRP into the tendon, and then we injected some of the PRP around in the tendon sheath. And this patient is back to running and the posterior tibial tendon has not been a big problem for him since. So here's the needle in the tendon sheath. You can see the tendon here, see the tendon sheath surrounding it, and you can see the needle within the sheath itself. Um, here's an example of somebody we did a, posterior, a peroneal tendon sheath injection on. So you can see the needle coming in from the side here um, into the peroneal tendon sheath. You can see that very clearly there. You can redirect it. You can make sure you're in the sheath. You can inject in the sheath. And then as the sheath distends, you can make sure that you're within the sheath. We've done a few things for Achilles tendinopathy. So we've obviously done peritendinous Achilles injections into the deep retrocalcaneal bursa. The nice thing about doing these injections, normally we start out by giving a small amount of local anesthetic. What this does is it tracks the into the into the tendon and it shows us. So it's almost like a sonoarthrographic effect. It can show us a tear if it's a bigger tear or a partial tear. And if that's the case, then obviously you don't want to inject into that deep retrocalcaneal bursa, at least not steroid because then you might cause a rapid rupture of that tendon. So you can see some of these things. We've done um, situations where we've gone into the, um, we've gone into the substance of the tendon itself. So here is um, an Achilles tendon that looks very tendinous. Here's the calcaneum, here's the thick Achilles tendon. And what you can do is get a needle into the tendon and turn on Doppler vascularity, find the more vascular portions of the tendon and direct the needle specifically into those areas and inject our PRP specifically into those areas. There are some publications that talk about injecting dextrose into the small vasculature to reduce the vascularity, which helps in pain reduction. Patients with anterior ring. So here the story is a, a footballer that I had who came to me with a simple complaint that he said every time he kicked the ball in step, he would suddenly find that he would just have to sit down for the next 10 minutes or the next few seconds because he had shooting pain. And so here you can see the impingement from the anterior talus is along the extensor digitorum longus tendon or along the neurovascular bundle. So here you can see on an MR, this is the tibia, this is the talus, this is the talar osseous spur, this is the extensor digitorum longus tendon, and you can see scarring and thickening along that EDL tendon sheath. We can look at a transverse image. So here's the talus, here's the extensor digitorum longus tendon sheath. Um, and here you can see the talus, the sheath, the neurovascular bundle and the scarring deep to it. Um, and what we can do here is we can get a needle that can be specifically targeted to inject either along the tendon sheath or along the traversing neurovascular bundle. Um, so we can be very specific on what we're injecting and we can try whether the symptoms are more tendon related or they are more nerve related. Here's a patient with anterolateral impingement with an anterior osseous um, body. Um, we can be quite specific in terms of getting an ultrasound uh, guided needle right near that bony body and assessing whether that anterolateral impingement is the cause of the patient's symptoms. Posterior impingement is something we've seen quite often in our cricketers because they have prominent os trigonums which impinge on their flexor hallucis longus tendon sheath. So here's the prominent os trigonum. Here is the FHL tendon sheath. And here's the fluid back here. And what you can see is uh, there is probably some impingement from that prominent posterior process of the talus. And um, here you can see on an MRI, um, sorry, um, here you can see on the MRI, this is where the uh, tendon is. And then here on ultrasound, we can actually use a very interesting technique that mediolaterally and get a needle right near the FHL tendon sheath and inject along that tendon sheath. And um, we've used this quite often for diagnostic and therapeutic cases of patients with posterior impingement. Morton's neuromas are obviously something we see. We can diagnose them on MR or on ultrasound. 
here is a Morton's neuroma on ultrasound. Here is what we can do is we can get through the intermetatarsal bursa uh, in the, into the, in, through the intermetatarsal space into the Morton's neuroma, inject it with steroid and local anesthetic. Here you can see the entire thing become in echogenic after it's been injected. Um, and then we can use that to keep that. This is another interesting procedure that I've learned more from working with orthopedic surgeons. The story is kind of that we had a patient who came with an ACL ganglion who was offered surgery, but he was due to travel the next day and he says he'd come back later and I happened to be in the surgeon's clinic. And I said, what if we just do an ultrasound guided decompression? And fortunately, um, working with uh, Anand Joshi, he was very open to the idea. So what we did was um, we uh, essentially took this patient in, we examined this patient and you can see here, but there's only about a 90 degree flexion from that ganglionic ACL. It doesn't flex more than 90 degrees here. Um, what we did was um, we identified in the posterior intercondylar notch this ganglion cyst. We got, um, we identified in both the axial. So you can imagine this is the axial plane. So this is your intercondylar notch and here's the cyst within it. So we looked at it in both here, the longitudinal plane, as well as in the axial plane. Then we come in the axial plane along the direction of the ACL. So here is the lateral femoral condyle, here's the tibia, and the lateral to median along the direction of the ACL. Get a needle into this. So here you can see the needle in slow motion entering right into that ganglion cyst. We get the needle in there. We aspirate what we can. Sometimes we get an aspirate, sometimes we don't. Otherwise, we just fenestrate it repeatedly. And here you can see me fenestrating that ACL ganglionic area. Um, repeatedly inject a small amount of local anesthetic and, um, and, and come out of there. And you can see how that ganglion has become significantly smaller in size as compared to the previous study. Um, this is the thick viscous aspirate we obtained from it. Here you can see the patient now post-procedure being able to flex the knee way more than 90 degrees. So we've done about 70 to 80 of those patients um, with very good We've worked on the patients who have a purely cystic ACL, a mucoid cystic ACL, as well as um, a purely mucoid ACL. And we're finding the results are pretty good there in the 60 to 70, maybe even 70 to 80% bracket in terms of response. Um, here's somebody who's got a paramenisical cyst. So obviously these are easy to diagnose um, and we can find them on ultrasound and we can inject and aspirate them really easily, get some thick aspirate out of them. Um, and um, the hip joint is another easy area to inject with the hip. Here you can see that you have the femoral head, abram. You have here the femoral neck, and you can get a longer needle right to the head neck junction, and that's normally where we like to inject the hip joint. Um, here's a patient who had a paralabral cyst posteriorly. This was a table tennis player who was sort of semi-professional but didn't plan to play table tennis for a long time. Didn't want to get hip surgery for a labral tear. So what we, and he was having symptoms that were kind of like sciatica. So what we did is we identified cyst under ultrasound and we went in on ultrasound and we ruptured that cyst. So this was a paralabral cyst aspiration in the posterior aspect of the hip that we did. There are enough reports about injecting the sacroiliac joints. And so that's, a, that's something we occasionally do. Um, it's not probably as satisfying as doing them under CT guidance just because you have more surety on those or you can at least demonstrate it better to somebody that you've done it but it's certainly something we've done a few times. Um, this is a patient with a muscle injury. So this is a footballer with muscle injury. And what you'll see from the scan is that there is some sort of heterogeneous, um, sorry, let me just go back a couple of slides. Um, so here's the patient with this muscle injury. Um, and um, what you will see here is um, with the muscle injury, there's heterogeneous tissue in this area, right here the region of the tear. Um, what you can do is you can bring a needle right exactly to the area of injury. You can fenestrate that area of injury. You can see the PRP tracking exactly into the tear. You can see the bubbles of PRP sort of tracking up and down here. Um, you can see them again here on this patient, uh, same patient in a different uh, location. So we can inject PRP into exactly the tear location. So here's again the needle coming in. Here we are at the tear location, fenestrating it and injecting it. And you can see the PRP spreading everywhere. Um, here it is again, spreading. So you can inject very specifically into the area of the injury. And there is some data to show that um, muscle injuries can benefit significantly from PRP injections. 
Um, once we're done with injections, I normally look at post-injection care, which is essentially making sure we apply a sterile dressing. I try and before the procedure, get a good sense of the patient's pre-procedure pain. So I ask them to tell me one, um, sort of how bad is the pain, zero to 10. Two is which are the positions in which the pain comes. And I ask them to make a mental note of it before we do the procedure. Just And I tell them that after the procedure, we're going to test these again. And I'm going to want you to tell me and improvement you have. So I think this is important in terms of assessing these. I do make sure that they follow up with the clinician that they were sent from because I think it's important for them to go back and, and sort of let them know where to do. I discuss the need for a basic physio. Um, I also do this is if, I, if, they, if they're from a referring physician, I make sure they go back and talk about physio to the physician. If they do not have a physio and they've never talked about that, then I will tell them that it's important I think it's important to close the loop in this area so that you get the best possible outcomes. I also discussed not has been cured just from the injection, but the injection forms the basis upon which they can hope to get better. Um, so they are clear that they need to do more and this is not where the buck stops. And I always provide a contact number in case of post patients, especially when you do procedures in the evening. It's very irritating for patients to have pain and, and issues and nobody to contact. So I give them those kind of contact numbers and I make sure that that contact number has somebody who will answer the phone for sure. So in summary, I think ultrasound allows for directed focused examination of a region that you want to inject. The pain generators are usually in close proximity or fairly small. Ultrasound guided injections can be extremely accurate and play a vital role in diagnosis and treatment. High patient satisfaction. Um, we have patients who come in who've had blind injections outside and who say that, please, doctor, do anything but don't give me an injection. And actually, some of the orthopedic surgeons I work with spend time explaining to them that an ultrasound guided injection will not be as bad as a blind injection. And I'm happy to say that most of those patients come out after our injections saying they're very, very happy and they never expected it to be uh, that comfortable. Um, I think it's very important for us to understand the indications, expected outcomes. Um, management of complications, but I think one of the key things is expectation management for patients, like to make them really aware that this is not the be all and end all, that this is not going to be a hundred percent solution and the outcomes are a little bit variable. And I find if I'm honest with them about that, they come in very clear about what they want to do and, um, and, they're, and they're happy with the results that they get. So I think building a good interactive team between the clinician, the musculoskeletal radiologist and the patient is really important in sort of building a really good uh, viable musculoskeletal ultrasound practice. So I think last but not least, ultrasound is a tricky and user dependent modality. It's got, a, it's got a long learning curve. So anything can be made to look like anything. So if you have a clinical suspicion for something, you can look anywhere on ultrasound and you will make something look like what you want it to look like. So it's good to have somebody who's objective who's looking at it. I think a good ultrasound support is very important to a successful practice. And I think if you support your local radiologist, they will support you back in more ways than you can imagine. So with that, I think I'll we'll stop my talk. Um, I don't have anything more to add at this stage. If any questions, please feel free to post them and we can come back with more on that. Uh, thanks a lot, Aditya. It was a wonderful talk. And uh, you've kind of covered the entire upper limb and lower limb from the perspective of a, you know, of a sports radiologist, if I may say so. Uh, I had a few questions after going through your talk, uh, may or may not be related to the work you do, but I'm pretty sure that you're the expert to answer them. And what common orthopedic surgeons do usually, uh, two very important uh, procedures which they do, one is injection for frozen shoulder, and the second is an injection in an osteoarthritis knee. Mm -hmm. So I wanted your opinion on both of them. If you do them, whether they should be done, they should not be done, especially steroids, uh, and, uh, you know, what are the indications and what exactly is, does the literature tell us on that? Okay. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't go through as much of the indications for the procedures uh, in this talk. I, I sort of focused more on what we can do when we go about doing it. But uh, yes, frozen shoulder is something that we treat quite often. In my experience, different surgeons have had different opinions on what they do. So the first thing about a frozen shoulder I find is that one needs to be sure that it's a frozen shoulder. And for that, I find that the common differential mistake that's made is that there's a missed small cuff tear. The second thing that is often missed is a subtle focus of calcific tendinosis. And that often happens when people just look at the MRI 
and don't look at the X-ray um, or they don't look at the X-ray in multiple views. They just get a single view and the calcification is hidden. Um, and that really puts you in a very, I feel very dumb at the end of that kind of situation. So I think before you make a diagnosis of uh, adhesive capsulitis, there are some very specific signs you can find on MRI. So be sure of the diagnosis. Now, once you're sure of the diagnosis, I've seen different people want different things done for frozen shoulders. Personally, in my practice, we do an intra-articular steroid injection. They're from 40 to 80 milligrams. There's some literature that suggests you can inject even up to 300 milligrams. Um, there's literature that says don't do anything. There's some people who talk about hydro distension in the shoulder. I do not do that. I have done a couple at request for somebody. It's not something we routinely do. So we normally, I would inject anywhere from 40 to 80 milligrams in about a total volume of five to six milliliters. I don't want to inject too much, especially if you're in the very um, acute flare phase, you inject a lot and patients get into awful pain issues. So the idea is to just reduce the inflammation temporarily. Um, I will use for intra-articular injections rather than bupivacaine and lidocaine because that is um, less chondrotoxic. Um, and I would do that. The other injections that people do for frozen shoulders sometimes is there's an element of subacromial pain, so you can inject this as well. Um, biceps tendon sheath injections essentially are an extension of an intra-articular injection because you're injecting into the upper portion of the biceps tendon sheath in the rotator interval with the idea that some will drip into the joint. So if you're going to go into the joint, you might as well go into the joint all the way. And I'm not sure that a rotator interval injection has that much added value, but you know, that's what some people do. And there's some people who do a suprascapular nerve block. I'm not a big fan of that, but that's another way of possibly dealing with it. I think the primary issue is capsular inflammation, injecting a small amount of local anesthetic with steroid to reduce the capsular in inflammation is ideal. If you're dealing with something in an early inflammatory phase, I would think of going with a lower volume injection. If you're dealing with something in a later sort of more stiffness phase, then maybe you would consider a higher volume injection just to try and see if you can create some more capsular mobility. But I'm not sure there's any good data to support that. Sorry, that just takes care of the frozen shoulder issue. Um, in terms of the intra-articular, I think there's recent literature that talks about us way overusing intra-articular knee steroid injections. And I do believe in that. In our practice, we see a fair amount of arthritic knees. Um, and I think in the vast majority of them, we do not inject steroid and local anesthetic. That being said, and I think one of the important things to remember with these patients is that they're usually uh, people who have had chronic knee pain who then present to you with acute exacerbation. When they do that, most of the time, it's because they've developed either a subchondral insufficiency fracture, and therefore they have that acute exacerbation of pain. By injecting a steroid, are we potentially weakening bone even more? Are we sort of promoting this, this um, you know, progressive, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis? I'm not really sure. So I think if you have a patient who has, today in today's day and age, if you have especially a young osteoarthritic knee with acute exacerbation of knee pain, what we should be doing is trying to figure out why that knee pain has exacerbated. If it is a unicompartmental or polycompartmental disease, and if it is a unicompartmental disease, start counseling them for a unicompartmental procedure or something that will help them to maintain their, um, you know, to get into a joint preservation strategy that would be more longstanding. For an older patient who has clear, you know, tricompartmental osteoarthritis with worsening and their next step is going to be a total knee arthroplasty and they just want something that will get them through the wedding season, then I suppose you could go ahead with steroid or anything else as long as they're very clear that, look, this is what the end game is. We don't know what it's going to do, but if it feels better, great. Enjoy it while it lasts. Fabulous. And uh, one more question, and this is about plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, again, something very common in orthopedic practice. Uh, and it's quite rampant as well to give uh, injections in the plantar fascia, and many a times... Uh, these patients don't do well with an injection, so the injection is repeated till a time that they come to a position where the pain doesn't go away with whatever you do. Right. So what is your strategy for such patients? I'm sure you must be getting a lot of patients who have this intractable or very severe plantar fasciitis, which is difficult to manage. So there's an interesting area of both the Achilles tendinosis and plantar fasciitis. And as you know, there are probably there are two connected structures in many ways. Um, there are two issues. is a primary tendinopathy that occurs 
And secondary is that when you have the tendinopathy, there is an osteopathy or an enthesopathy that occurs. And when these patients come in with pain, um, especially with Achilles pain, um, the instant belief is that this is achillodynia because of Achilles tendinopathy. Um, and uh, the traditional treatment, as we know, is Alfredson stretches, so people get onto eccentric loading programs and all the rest of it. One of the things that people forget is sometimes that enthesopathic bone gets inflamed or gets a stress reaction, and they get pain from that. And when they go into rehab programs for that with the bone edema, then the bone edema needs to get worse because the stress reaction that you are overloading. So I think one thing is to realize is, is this primarily a tendinopathy or is it more of a, an osteopathy you are dealing with? And the same is true to some extent for the plantar fascia patients. Once you've determined that it's primarily a tendinopathy, um, the strategy that we have is we have done a reasonable number of steroid injections. When we do them under ultrasound guidance, I think a few things that we do is one is we can look at the status of the plantar fascia itself. Is it really thickened? Is it mildly thickened? You know, what's this, or is it almost torn? So it gives you a sense of what is the status of that tissue over there. The second thing that we do is we inject over the surface of the fascia. So when we're looking with ultrasound, we can be very clear that we're on the surface and we're not within the fascia itself, which is kind of helpful. Um, the third thing that we do is I inject a small volume because there is a risk of plantar fat pad necrosis when we do it. There's also a technique where you can inject transversely so you can go into the deep aspect of the fascia as opposed to the superficial aspect of the fascia. But I think with many of the foot and ankle surgeons that I'm working with nowadays, the increasing um, preponderance is to go with physio and then tell patients that probably a better way to go about things is to get a PRP injection at this stage rather than to get a steroid injection. So with our patients, for the most part, I would say whenever we have the discussions, we say for things like tendinopathy, we can use steroids, we can use PRP. Uh, the data is obviously out a little bit on both, um, but um, but we do generally tend to um, tell people that look for something like for plantar fascia um, or for achillodynia, you're probably better off doing a PRP if you can assess your tendon quality enough to take the PRP um, because it's more biologic. This is going to be a chronic issue that's going to bother you, and these are otherwise relatively robust structures. So favor PRP over um, steroid in these situations. Right. So thank you very much, Aditya. And I'm pretty sure that the viewers of this webinar will have more questions. And we'll encourage uh, all the viewers to kindly post it in the comment section. And we will forward it to Aditya and Aditya will help us answer them. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Aditya Daftari. It was wonderful for you to be here, spend time with us and teach us many things about which we practice, but not necessarily all of us are aware. Thank you so much, Aditya. Thank you, Swapnal. Thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you.